Hey, so this should be a very easy lecture uh, pipelining. And you guys can take your time to read through these pages. It's not a lot of information, okay? It's just few things which I'm going to simplify for you. Imagine a scenario where you have a lot of bricks lying on one side of the room, right? And you are a team of four people and your task is transfer these hundred bricks on one corner of the room to the opposite corner of the room. What is the best strategy a team can do to transfer all these blocks in the shortest possible time? I have a funny feeling it has to do with the pipeline. Well, well, pipelining concept in computers came after the humans have devised these kind of techniques. See, computer era started in, in 1970s, 80s, but the human logic and these tricks have been well designed, right? What is the best strategy to transfer these hundred blocks from one edge of the room to the opposite edge in a team of like, place, let's say four people? Okay, I'm going to give you two options and you tell me which one of the two makes a more efficient approach. Let's say there are two teams. What team A does is each member picks up a block, runs all the way to the opposite edge of the room and then puts the block there, comes back, picks up another one. So you have like three, you have like four people going back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. Now there's another team who decided that, okay, we are not going to run back and forth. What we're going to do is we're going to align ourselves along the edge of the room. The first person's task is to take the brick, pass it to the second guy in the line. The second guy in the line will pass that brick to the third guy in the line. The third will pass it to the fourth and the fourth will put it on the other side of the room. Which of the two approaches is faster? Are you guys writing on the chat or is this anyone? Yeah, it's being typed in the chat. Yeah, option two, it's an assembly line. If you know how these McDonald's and all these franchises work, you should be able to understand how it goes, right? It's just like how a production line works, assembly, right? Your McDonald's started with a speedy system. Watch that movie, The Founder. It's a document, it's a movie on Netflix, okay? <laughs> It was fun to know a lot of things, right? So it was called a speedy system where the concept of fast food was established by McDonald's. And the reason behind it was when it was a small unit in San Bernardino. Uh, I think there was this one small county in Los Angeles, right? I might be missing up the name of San Bernardino, something like that, okay? So they had this small unit and what they did well was to bring food as quickly as possible to the customers in line, right? And that was their idea, to create a speedy system where you have all these stations for hamburgers, fries, and keep it in a way that no two people have to cross each other's path and you basically run a production line. One guy is flipping the burgers, the other one is assembling, assembling the bread and the mayo and everything. The other one is packaging it, the another one is is like cook, uh, is like frying the fr uh, potatoes for the fries. So you have this system of assembly line, right? Another idea is the Ford, Henry Ford, right? The car, the production line for vehicles was started back then. Rather than have one product or one car being made before starting the next car production, create an assembly line where you have a dedicated workstations and you transfer this product on across this assembly line where every station is working on a task which they are well uh, accustomed to. So there might be one task which is like assembling the frame. There's another workstation which is like fixing the windows, right? Another one is putting an engine. Another one is doing all that circuitry and wiring. 
So what is the benefit of such kind of system, right? Another example, let's take another example and then assign numbers to it, right? Think of the fact that you want to do four loads of laundry and you have four stations. One is a washer, the another one is a dryer, the third one is your fold and the fourth one is a stasher, right? So wash, you dry, then you fold and then you stash it in your water. So you have four stations, right? And you suppose you have four people doing these tasks for each laundry, right? Each, each load of laundry. Now, if every stage, which is wash, dry, fold and stash takes 30 minutes of time, can you tell me how much time does it take for one load to completely go through this pipeline? Uh, please be verbal. It's difficult for me to like see the chat and then yeah, if it's possible, just somebody relay the answer, right? It's quicker. If you have 30 minutes at each station, what is the time taken for each load? Do you get two hours, 30 minutes each, two hours for each load? That is called as latency, okay? You can make your notes or you can read this document. So. This is called latency. Latency is defined as time taken for a task. So no matter what you do, the time taken for each load would be two hours. Now, if you, if you have four loads and you use this strategy A where you will wait for the first load to be completed entirely before starting with the next load, how much time are you going to spend for four loads? A lot. <laughs> There's a value for a lot. If you have 30 minutes for each stage, so you are basically taking two hours for every load. If every load ha is pushed into this pipeline, only when the earlier load has completely gone through, then you are spending eight hours. Now, what if you employ a pipeline strategy where you push the first load into this wash stage, right? After 30 minutes, that laundry, which is laundry A or the load A goes into the dryer. Now your washer is now sitting idle. So what you can do is push load B into your washer. So now when, the, when one hour has passed, your load A has completed two cycles, wash and dry, and your load B has completed the first cycle. So after one hour, you push your load A into your third stage, which is fold. Load B now moves to the dry stage. Now the load C can enter the pipeline at the wash stage, right? So you see how you are using this pipeline or an assembly line to your advantage, right? So this is what pipelining is all about. Even in computer, this is in terms of instructions. Every instruction has to go through various stages in your program. And we briefly touched upon those when we discussed assembly. These are like fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. So five stages for every program for every instruction. So if you have multiple instructions in your program, you can use a pipeline or the computer uses this pipeline for enhancing the performance of your uh, calculations, right? So it's all about how quickly can you do something, right? So this is one of the tricks used in modern computers to parallelize operations because you, do, you have resources or you have resources waiting for you. So your, it's in your best interest to fill all these resources with some tasks so that they're not sitting idle, right? So this is the diagram, okay? So this is called a pipeline diagram. You have the loads written here, L1, L2, L3, L4. So this load is basically the laundry load, right? And then you have like 30, 60, 90, 120. So on the X axis, you have the time scale right, from zero till 210. So if you see, your four loads used to take you eight hours, right? It used to take you eight hours. Now, 
how much time is it going to take you through a pipeline approach? I think the answer is on your screen. All right. So, so a few things to note here is time to complete a single load remains the same. It's two hours. Like if you look at the load level, every bag of clothes is taking two hours, but the benefit is coming from the fact that whilst the other load is in some stage, your other bags are also on some stages behind that first load. So everyone is right behind each other, right? So at some time, at that time, everything would pass through that system, right? So while the total time for any given load remains unchanged at two hours, it is notable that after the first load is finished, that is, in other words, the pipeline is full, every load after that finishes at a beat rate of 30 minutes. That means after the first load, has gone through the system, right? After the first load has gone through the system, then every other load is coming out of that pipeline at 30 minutes, right? Because every stage is at 30 minutes. This beat rate is commonly called as throughput. So your, so your latency remains the same, be it strategy or A or the pipeline strategy. The improvement is in the throughput. Like how many tasks you can get done within a unit time, right? So if you want to calculate the speed up, the so speed up is, uh, speed up is defined as how much is the improvement based on this sequential execution compared to this pipeline. So you had 480 uh, minutes, right? Which is eight hours, 480 minutes divided by 210. 210 is from the pipeline, 480 is from the, the naive way, right? So you are performing at a speed up of 2.3 times, which is a lot, right? So in summary, your latency is two hours and that does not change, be it a pipeline or a non-pipeline approach, but your throughput changes. Now it is one load every 30 minutes compared to one load every four hours, right? Earlier, the through, what was the throughput in the non-pipeline stage? You have one load every two hours. Now your throughput is one load is getting processed in every 30 minutes, right? So your speed up of 2.3 times. Okay, so you can read the details here. So I'm going to show you uh, some pictures to illustrate. Okay, so this is what we were talking about. So we divide the entire process in stages. And it's in your best interest that it's you can just hope that these stages take the same time. But it's not always possible. Some of the stages here might take longer time. Right. And because one, some of these stages might take longer time, there would be a kind of a stall in your pipeline. That means one load is now waiting to be pushed into the next stage, but because that stage is not working at the same rate as other stages, there would be kind of a stall, right? And that's how a congestion is created, right? So if you have this machine, if you have these stages and every stage is working at the same rate, so you have this continuous uh, outflow of uh, loads from the system. But, some, but if one of the stage takes a longer time, right, then the, that stage becomes the critical, uh, it, it becomes, or it defines your latency, basically. Because now everything depends on that one stage, the worst case analysis. You cannot do better than that worst performing stage, right? So in that case, you need to wait for that stage to be available. And even if it means that you, you're, you are already done in your stage two, suppose in stage two, you're already done, but the stage three is taking more time than usual, right? So in that way, you, there would be kind of an, a pipe, we call it as a pipeline stalls, like 
there would be these bubbles created in the pipeline where you would be like, oh, let me wait now because I cannot move ahead even though I'm ready, right? So you will find all that in these uh, slides. So there, there are some homeworks that you can do, okay? So what you can do is from the slides after you try to solve this, you can drag and reveal this, right? So you can move this and see what the answer is, okay? So these are something that you can try it out, right? So I've given some examples here, I've borrowed from some slides. So you can see here that at one point in time, all the stages would be fully, will be under full utilization. And that's what you ideally want. You don't want any resource to be sitting idle, any hardware resource to be sitting idle. So you want to fill up the pipeline in a way that everyone is working at a given point of time. Right, so this is an example of a car assembly. The first one is a non pipeline approach. That means you're building the entire car first before pushing the new car, right? But then a pipeline approach is this assembly line. So you have different workstations which specialize in different tasks, right? So what you do is you keep passing your uh, product along these lines and it will come out as a finished product at the end, right? So let's put this in perspective of our computer programs. So every instruction has to go through these different stages, right? Now there's a choice. In hack program, so far we learned that, okay, let's wait for the entire instruction to be executed by your CPU before you read an instruction from your ROM, right? So that is an atomic operation. That means you do not push the second instruction until the first instruction is fully executed. But then pipelining is saying, oh no, let's not do that. Let's try to divide the entire journey into these five stages. Instruction fetch, which is IF. Instruction decode, which is ID. EX is execute. MEM is memory access. And WB is write back. You want to update the memory, right? So. What we can do is we can now, if you have like 60, six instructions, you can push them into this pipeline of five stages, one behind each other, right? So this is just an example of how a perfect pipeline would look as, would, uh, would look, right? So it's, it's just borrowed from the same principle of assembly line, nothing fancy, right? So this is what, they're basically talking about. And to be able to do that, every stage should have its own distinct purpose. So you should be able to segregate. So, so as a designer, they should be able to segregate that what does an instruction typically go through? It can happen that an instruction does not need a memory access, but at a whole level, they're trying to say, oh, let's create our unique baseline, which means no matter what the instruction is, we have this five stage pipeline. And you can change the number of stages in a pipeline depending on how much improvement you want. If you're building your own custom built computer, right? So you can decide how many pipeline stages you want based on your instruction set, right? So let's define these in detail, right? So execute was something like fetch means your instruction fetch increment PC. These are the steps in fetch. That means you're bringing some instruction from the program memory into your CPU, right? Decode means you are, you have the 16 bit in your, hack, in your hack instruction. You're trying to decode it, right? You're trying to see, okay, what does this instruction tell you? What needs to be done? Okay, if, if it's an A instruction or a C instruction, if it's a C instruction, does it have, what kind of compute it has, what kind of jump it has, what kind of destination it has. So you're trying to make sense of the decode, right? Now, execute is the actual execution. If there is any arithmetic or a logical component that needs to be done, if it's a C instruction which asks you to calculate something or invoke the ALU, right? It falls under execute, right? Memory means if you're, ALU operation needs to access some value from the main memory, right? 
or if it wants to store a value in the main memory. So if there's anything to do with the main memory, that is called as MEM, the MEM stage, right? And the last stage, which is WB, which is called as write back, is write data back to the register. So in terms of a hack assembly, if there's instruction which asks you to write it back to your D registers, right? Remember there was this feedback loop from your ALU to your D register. That is the write back mechanism, right? So I'm going to show you this diagram, right? So when you say something like D equal to M, Remember M is coming from a register, D is from a register and registers are based on time. So, so ideally your DT is memory at A, T minus one. So there is a delay that is happening, right? Because it's a sequential circuit. Everything is made up of DFS, right? So in that spirit, what we do is divide this entire stage into five stage in, in this entire execution to five stages. So you have instruction memory, memory and PC at instruction fetch. You play with the registers and understand what your instruction is at the decode fetch, right? At the third stage, you are executing using your ALU. And the fourth stage, you are using your data memory. And the fifth is write it back to the registers, right? So what we do is we push, we insert these blue buffers in your data path so that you can wait in that buffer before being pushed to the next stage. So what was a direct process from left to right in a non-pipelined approach, now by adding these buffers in between, you have made it as a five stage execution. So at every stage you can wait at the buffer before being pushed to the next stage in the pipeline, right? So typically this is what you will get. IF, ID, EX, MEM, and WB. Okay, so let me check the time. Okay, I still have a few minutes left. So, so it can happen that based on what kind of instruction it is, it may or may not invoke a given stage, right? So for example, if you have something like D equal to A, there is nothing to be done with memory state, right? That means that instruction, so that memory stage needs to sit idle because your D equal to A should not be going through that pipeline, right? So for that one cycle, that D equal to A stops before the memory because there's no need for the memory state. There's no need for the write back stage, right? So it really depends what kind of instructions are there in a given program, right? So in that respect, so this is I think our last slide which enforces this thing. We, ha we have a notion of pipeline overhead. And this comes from the fact that what if the instruction you're trying to execute depends on an instruction before that, right? For example, look into this pseudo assembly, right? This is not a hack assembly, but Look at this toy assembly. Line one is register one is memory register two. That means go to R2, whatever the value of R2 is, is the, mem is the address. So go to that memory address. So R2 acts as a pointer, right? So you grab that value and you store it into R1, cool? Then your R2 is updated with the memory of R4. So if you look at R L1 and L2, is there any conflict? Is there any conflict between L1 and L2? Um, L2 or er, L1 requires L2, correct? But L1 is executing first, right? So L2 needs to update R2 only when L1 has used R2. Are you guys getting this idea? That means L1 should have gone through that execution phase, right? L1 should have gone through that phase of using R2 before R2 is updated, okay? So that is one thing that you need to keep in mind, right? So this is called as write after read. 
So you're reading in the first stage, but then you're writing. So it's write after read, right? What is L3 doing? L3 is trying to reuse the updated R2 and overwrite R2 again. That means L3 has to wait for your proper program execution. Your L3 has to wait until L2 has gone through the write back phase, right? Only when L2 has written it to the memory R2, you're going to read it and then update R2. So there is a kind of a dependency. So L3 is exhibiting read after write because it's trying to read after R2 has been written, right? And within itself, it is. it also waits for this R2 to be there to update the new R2. So this is fine but the R2 is here depending on this L2, right? So if we look into this pipeline, we have to understand, okay? So this would be a last uh, topic that you should understand. Let's look into L1, okay? Forget about everything, right? Look at L1 in the first cycle. Now it's given to you, make it, the, the, the given assumption is every stage, IF, ID, EXE, MEM, and WB take one clock cycle each, right? So L1 in the first clock cycle, it's in the instruction fetch. It's in the instruction fetch phase. At clock cycle two, L1 moves to the ID phase, right? And then you can do instruction fetch for L2, right? Then at clock cycle three, L1 goes into your execution phase. L2 goes into your instruction decode phase. L3 can go into your instruction fetch phase. Right? That means you're just fetching the instruction from the ROM. You're, st you're still not used R1 plus R2 because that's an execution. So you've not used that yet. But look into this one, right? By the time you come to C4, the pipeline is filled up. That means all the stages are working on their own instruction line. MEM is working on instruction line L1, X is L2, ID is on L3, IF is on L4, right? But then see what happens. At memory stage, in L1, right, your R1 becomes available here. So only after write back, like after you've gone to the entire pipeline, your R1 is available, right? So R1 becomes available here, but R1 needs to be used in L3 and L4, right? So that means L3 and L4 are not going to push their, going to move to the next stage. Right, so R1 becomes available here. At C6, your R2 is available, right? And if you look at L3, it needs both R1 and R2, right? So why do we have two stalls here before ID, before L3 moves into executing R1 plus R2? Because it has to wait for R2. Right, L4 can only enter, sorry, L3, yeah? L3 can only enter execution in cycle C7 because it needs L2 to finish up in cycle six because L2 will give me the new R2. So it has to wait for C5 and C6 before L3 can be pushed to execute cycle. That means R1 plus an R2 will happen in cycle number seven, only when the write backs of the prior dependent stages are done, right? Then ex execute memory write back. Now, what about L4? L4 needs R1. When are, when are we getting R1? We are getting R1 after C5, right? So after C5, instruction IF was ready to go to instruction decode, but it could not go to instruction decode in C6. Why? Because that instruction decode is occupied by L3 and it is waiting. So even though L4 was ready to go to ID stage, but there's only one ID. There's only one component which is doing that ID stage and it's already occupied with L3. So only when L3 releases and goes into X phase, only then L4 now can enter the ID phase. So even if like ID finishes, it still holds onto it. It doesn't just open up. No, and that's why we need to have these buffer stages, these blue buffers in every stage. Even though in this case, your L4 was ready to go into the decode stage. It could not because that component is occupied by L3. Only when L3 releases ID by going to X phase, you get an ID, right? 
so that's the idea of like why they can be stalled even if all the cycles are working perfectly but how your instructions are dependent with each other it can create pipeline stalls so that gives a benefit of like how do you want to write your codes or programs in a way that you can avoid pipeline stallings okay that means there's a gap in the stage so your efficiency has reduced because you have to wait certain number of clock cycles before using that so there are many policies that exist which are beyond the scope of this introductory class but when you take higher of uh, like advanced courses in architecture there are many policies of how can you resolve all this and there is also a notion of if you have loops in your program if you have conditionals in your program right based on a condition if or else right you want to follow one set of programs or the other set of programs so again you have to estimate what what are the pipeline stages going to be if it's a true or a false so this is something called as branch prediction right so daniel himenes in our department so he did a great work back in 2001 and his uh, so he did some neural networks for branch prediction and that is one of the highly cited works uh, in like in this uh, in this ml machine learning based uh, br uh branch prediction schemes and there are like many research which is still going on there are still many papers being published in computer architecture conferences on how you can improve these efficiencies and all right so this is something exciting and hopefully this introductory course can of course can only touch upon these concepts but if you're excited do take an opportunity to take higher uh, advanced courses in architecture if you are key right so with that i want to like wrap our course and hopefully you guys have enjoyed the learning process and interacting with each other and i would really again remind you guys to fill up the course survey uh it's very important for us uh, as faculty members and for me as a student to be able to carry forward your feedback things you like things we could improve so just express whatever you, you thought about this course all right so and i'll see you on tuesday for our final review session okay if there, if there are any questions i would be here uh, on zoom for five more minutes and let me know okay thank uh, you thank you